yet another entry into the portable emulator market. It requires a little bit of work on your end, not just getting the games on here, but you actually build this thing from the ground up. The Clockwork Pi Game Shell version 2 is a really fun project and you get a pretty decent gaming machine out of it too. I did have some minor problems that made me want to break this thing into more pieces than it came as, but they were all my fault. It's all my fault. The Clockwork Pi Game Shell started as a Kickstarter project at the end of 2017 and raised $290,000 and is now a product you can actually purchase. One of the few Kickstarter projects that actually has a happy ending. Its elevator pitch is that it's an open source retro gaming and STEM portable console, which means it's for people who like to tinker and it's for students who might wanna learn how to engineer and develop their own hardware. It comes with all the software you need to get going, including some emulators powered by RetroArch and the full version of RetroArch in case you want to download even more emulator cores. It even comes with two free games if you don't wanna be a thief. Cave Story and Doom. I was able to play NES, SNES, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Sega Genesis, and name games on here. Performance was adequate. The more graphically intensive stuff could come with some issues. With some tinkering, some people are able to get original PlayStation games to work on one of these things. I just downloaded the RetroArch core and it didn't work, so I just gave up. Surprisingly, Game Boy Advance performed better than Sega Genesis did, but I'm getting ahead of myself. First, we need to put the whole thing together. Putting the physical unit together is kind of the whole draw of the game shell. It took me a little under an hour to put it all together, and I did it with no tools. They tell you to use a box cutter or a wire clipper to cut the plastic ends, but I just wiggled them loose. You might want to use tools or some sandpaper to prevent jagged plastic, but all these parts are for the inside, so it's not that big of a deal. The project looks and sounds daunting, but it's not any worse than assembling IKEA furniture. The instructions are very easy to follow. It might take you a minute to find each module because they're not labeled in their boxes or bags, but the pictures are detailed enough that you can figure it out pretty easily. So after setting up the whole thing, I found the SD card and it goes on the inside of the device. So I had to take the whole thing apart again, just put the SD card back in. If only they had told you to do that in the directions. Oh wait, they did. Originally, I had thought this was poor design, leaving the micro SD card slot on the inside of the device where you can't get to it. But this is for good reason. Anyway, I turned the thing on for the first time and it just worked without a hitch. I was pretty surprised at how easy it was and how well it worked considering stupid ass me put it together. It's a good feeling, something that's missing when you buy an already built emulation device off the shelf. As for the build quality, again, considering how modular it is, it is pretty solid. The buttons feel pretty good too. Even the D-pad feels good, although it's not the ball joint D-pad that I prefer, but it's big enough where it doesn't really matter. And it's a good looking screen as well. Now, all that's left to do is put the games on here. The game shell has a Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in. You cannot just plug this into a computer via the micro USB port and transfer games that way. At least it didn't work on my Mac. You must use TinyCloud to transfer data over Wi-Fi. I don't know if you realize, but I'm not at home right now. I'm at my parents' new place that hasn't been built yet. And that's no way to it. So stupid ass me decided to take the SD card out, plug it into the computer and transfer the ROMs that way. The computer can't actually read the SD card because it's formatted for Linux. No problem, I'll just reformat. Don't do this. The micro SD card comes with the operating system built into it. It's not on the device itself. It doesn't get flashed to the micro SD card when you insert it for the first time. It is already on the micro SD card when it comes to you. And getting it back onto the micro SD card is a bitch and a half. So just take the damn micro SD card, stick it into the device while you're building it and never touch it again. So the only way to get games on here from your computer is over Wi-Fi. I tried using a router that wasn't connected to the internet and that doesn't work. You need a router that's connected to the internet for some reason, so I used my phone. And that worked. I was able to remote into the game shell from Finder and everything. 
After figuring that out, it went off without a hitch. The internet connection is also required for initializing each built-in emulator and for automatically downloading the additional retro arc cores that you want. Hoot doggy, that was a lot of work. Well, now that it's all set up, how does it play? Unfortunately, there's a decent amount of screen tearing across all emulators, including NES and Game Boy. This isn't something that's game breaking, but it's there and it's something that hardware sticklers are definitely going to notice. NES and SNES run just fine. I'm actually surprised at just how well SNES runs. I also learned that I have the PAL version of Mega Man X because it runs at a steady 50 frames per second and it's way slower than I remember it being. Anyway, I think it's weird that the system comes with a Super Famicom emulator that only recognizes Super Famicom ROM files, but RetroArch can play SNES games just fine. Game Boy and Game Boy Color also run great. I've heard some people having problems with Game Boy Advance, but I didn't really have too many. The occasional frame dip, but nothing that impacted the gameplay in any significant way. And if you just want to play something like Pokemon Ruby or Fire Red, this thing's going to run it just fine. The only flaw that I found was that the device that I put together does not have L and R buttons. It came with an additional module called the light key, which would work as an L and R button, but it sticks out of the back and I'm not doing that. For now, L and R is shift plus A or shift plus B, which isn't gonna work for action games, but what are you gonna do? Sega Genesis performed the worst. Audio glitched pretty frequently, and this usually coincided with significant frame drops and stuttering. This happened in both Sonic and & Knuckles and Shinobi 3. They're still playable, but it's far from the ideal way to play. Weirdly, Gunstar Heroes runs fine. That game has lots of shit going on on screen, so I'm not sure why that is. Even weirder, the Game Boy Advance game Gunstar Superheroes, which is way more graphically intensive, runs with barely any frame drops. By default, the controls are set up in the Xbox configuration. This means that B and A are flipped if you're used to the Nintendo configuration. This also means that playing Mario is real weird. Considering this is more geared towards retro gaming, I would think that the SNES control scheme is more preferred by most people. Luckily, it's an easy fix. You can switch to the SNES configuration in the settings. These are your only two options, and you can update RetroArch to reflect those changes. You must select to update RetroArch or else your games won't recognize the change and your Mario controls will forever be backwards. Also, the UI is fine for what it is, but I absolutely hate when they're changing buttons around on me, especially the back button. Do you know how many times I've added a game to my favorites just because I wanted to back out of the menu? A user-friendly UI might be asking a little much considering this is a do-it-yourself piece of tech. So with that in mind, I'll try not to take this decent UI for granted. I already mentioned most of the features that this DIY kit comes with, but it also comes with a micro HDMI port. This is an exciting addition that I unfortunately didn't get a chance to play around with in this big empty room but I didn't hear great things about it. Performance was already just about adequate on its own, so when plugged into a TV, the device is taxed by that higher resolution. If Genesis didn't perform well before, it certainly won't play well now. ETA Prime has a good video where he goes more in depth on the problems with the HDMI output and also his problems with Game Boy Advance and Sega Genesis emulation. So if you wanna buy one of these for any of those reasons, then definitely check out that video first. The Clockwork Pie Game Shell version 2 is a fun little weekend project. It's even great if you want to get someone interested in modding. It's also a great educational tool. As just an emulation device though, I can't quite recommend it. If you want to play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and NES games, the BitBoy is significantly smaller, it's way more pocketable, the screen is better, and it's only $40. The game shell right now is $160, down from $200. If you just want a portable emulation device, something that you don't have to put together yourself, the GPD XD is probably your best option. It can play everything up through N64 without a hitch, and it runs on Android. So the OS is a lot easier to get around if you want to add more emulators or something. 
It's currently $230 on Amazon, but if you get it from GearBest, it's only $170. So that puts it in direct competition with this thing. But we don't get a kickback from GearBest. Also, do I have to mention that this was a free product? I got this for free. The BitBoy was also a free product. The GPDXD was not a free product. I borrowed that from a friend. So does that count that as free? So only get the game shell if you're a maker yourself or you're interested in trying to put something like this together. There is something powerful behind that feeling of accomplishment, playing games on a device that you built with your bare hands. But for the rest of us who can't be bothered and just wanna play our retro games at their best, there are better options out there. So what do you guys think about the Clockwork Pi game shell? Is tinkering around with something like this something that you would be interested in? Do you have any ideas what you would do with something like this? Did I do something wrong that you really just don't like? Leave it in the comments below, at me on Twitter, and all this other social media garbage. Of course, we got new videos all the time. Our schedule is in a pinned tweet over on our Twitter. We got live streams here on YouTube and also on twitch.tv slash wolfden, but not until I get back from here. But if you support us here on YouTube, clicking that join button, or you go over to twitch.tv slash wolfden and subscribe using Twitch Prime, which is free if you have Amazon Prime, then you can link it to your Discord account and get into our supporter-only Discord where we post videos like this early. We also play games with our supporters once a month. But of course, the most important thing that you can do is just subscribe to the channel, that's easy. And share this video with a friend, a friend who is into modding or would be interested in something that they have to put together like this. Thank you guys very much. You have yourself a very good week. Here's here's the beach. Here's, here's the here it is. Wow.